I just uh, have been dying to talk about uh, uh, Putin and what's going on in the Crimea and, uh, and everything, because it certainly uh, has at least a, a bearing on Bible prophecy uh, in terms of the fact in Ezekiel uh, 37, 38, there is a, 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 Rush, a dominant Russian leader uh, over that country, Ezekiel prophesied, uh, who would, uh, in the, uh, the last days, uh, make a confederation with ancient Persia, which, of course, they've done. You know, uh, there's been dozens, if not hundreds, of Russian scientists who have pretty much built the nuclear program on many uh, different locations that are in Iran today. And they are, uh, they are very close to having a, a nuclear bomb. Uh, and there's uh, every, every estimate from, from days to weeks to, uh, to months. Uh, and I don't think anybody is saying beyond six months. Uh, so we have that uh, dilemma going on. Uh, Ezekiel said there would be this confederation of this dominant uh, Russian leader uh, who would uh, make that confederation, uh, and then along with some other all I Islamic countries, uh, and uh, they are named there, uh, they will then make a move towards, uh, towards Israel to try to take over Israel. Uh, Ezekiel describes uh, it uh, in the metaphors, he'll place a hook into the jaw of Magog to try to draw him into the conflict. Uh, and, of course, through the years, uh, many, including myself, has tried to figure out what that hook in the jaw is. Uh, and uh, we have at least said and actually showed you uh, slides of the, uh, uh, the new uh, uh, oil reserves that Israel has found uh, off their coast in the Mediterranean. Uh, one of them is online now and uh, is made Israel energy sufficient. Uh, they don't uh, import oil or natural gas uh, uh, any longer, and the bigger of the two is, uh, is getting ready to come online uh, as soon as it does, then they will be in the exporting business of, uh, of uh, energy, uh, and if they, of course, one of their uh, markets they potentially could uh, sell to would be Western Europe right now gaining all of their energy from Russia. That would make uh, Vladimir Putin just a little upset, and uh, he's already uh, uh, strategizing and so forth. He is uh, a brilliant uh, a former colonel of the KGB, he knows what he's doing. His foreign minister uh, that uh, acts on his behalf, his, uh, and akin, uh, akin to our Secretary of State, is a brilliant guy. Uh, they have a strategy and plan. Uh, and we are watching in our day uh, what, uh, what none of us, except Charlie, uh, was alive to see when uh, Hitler began to uh, take over uh, and began to annex uh, uh, countries in Europe uh, and uh, without firing a shot. One of the things you may have noticed if you're uh, watching the news uh, carefully, when, uh, when the Russian uh, military went into Crimea, they were almost Russian military. You notice they had brand new uniforms and brand new weapons that had never been shot. And uh, they were just uh, basically a bunch of guys they rounded up and put them in uniforms and just says, walk across that border, nobody's going to do a thing. And, uh, and nobody did. And uh, uh, there was a vote in the Crimea not just six, six months ago, and 53% of the people that live there said, said, no, we don't want to be part of Russia. But it's funny how you bring a bunch of tanks and people with automatic weapons into the street and it says, we're going to take that vote again. Hey, 96% say we're, we're okay with this. <laughs> so he has uh, moved to the Crimea. He's got thousands of troops, uh, as you know, uh, stationed across uh, some uh, uh, the Ukraine. And the Ukraine, by the way, is the most evangelical country in Europe. More, more evangelical Christians there than any other country. Tremendous move of God in that country after the uh, uh, post-USSR. Yeah, uh, some of our guys went in, a lot of Calvary chapels that are there uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, God's been doing a tremendous work, uh, and uh, which uh, may or may not have affected or led to uh, people in the streets protesting the Russian puppet government that was placed over them. Uh, and, uh, and willing to go out in the streets by the tens of thousands, even though they were being shot, over 90 of them killed, most of them by sharpshooters, military guys uh, up on the buildings to try to uh, end the protest, but they continued. The president, uh, appointed president of the Ukraine now, right now is a pastor, he's a Baptist pastor, and he says it was, it's a miracle of God uh, what has taken place there. Uh, that uh, people still turned out, even though they risked their lives to have some sense of freedom and democracy. Uh, they have it now, and of course, it's being, uh, being threatened. And, uh, and Putin's got his sights on uh, other, other countries where he can justify, because they're Russian-speaking people, uh, in portions of other Eastern Bloc countries, uh, he can justify going in to protect them and the Russian uh, people there in the same way he's done in the uh, Crimea. So, 
uh, he is uh, growing more powerful. Now, what fascinates me about this, and it's kind of interesting to see, is that I'm, uh, I'm watching the, the news at night and watching uh, uh, our, uh, our political talking head types on there saying the things that we were saying four and five years ago in, term, in terms of quoting uh, Putin, uh, for example, uh, he has said that uh, uh, the greatest tragedy uh, in the 20th century was that uh, was the falling apart of the uh, former USSR. <laughs> There's a few things that took place in the 20th century, uh, but uh, he is, sees himself as the uh, is the uh, uh, returning Russia to its golden years under the czars, and he sees himself in holding that kind of position. So he's uh, he. He very well, he certainly fits right now, anything can happen tomorrow, but he fits right now uh, this definition of this uh, Magog and Gog, this dominant leader. Uh, of course, they've already has the ties with uh, uh, Persia, uh, and so we, we could be uh, again approaching and moving closer to the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, 38. And again, once they make that move against Israel, God will intervene supernaturally on behalf uh, of the people there. Uh, and uh, once he does that, he'll destroy uh, two-thirds of the military. Uh, Russia will be uh, no more the power that they are uh, in the world today. Uh, and uh, it will be done in such a way supernaturally that the world may know that there's a God over Israel. Uh, and uh, certainly will uh, move or act to move the hearts of the people there uh, back t to God. All of this leading, of course, and pushing towards what we call the uh, last seven-year period, the Great uh, Tribulation. So, yeah, very interesting things uh, going, going on. Pray for the people of the Ukraine. They'd be able to maintain their uh, independence and their religious freedom that they uh, enjoy now. Uh, and pray that uh, people would be uh, awakened uh, to what's going on in the world and for believers to realize that our time uh, could be uh, very, very short. I uh, uh, also, in, uh, in parallel with that, uh, Secretary of State Kerry has been uh, trying to keep the peace talks with the Palestinians alive and going. It was set up so that it would, uh, they would either reach a peace deal uh, or it would end uh, at the, uh, sometime in April. We're coming up a few weeks from that. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu met, Netanyahu met with uh, uh, our president a few weeks ago. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, was there uh, a short, uh, maybe last week or so. Uh, and there's a, a real push for the Israelis to, uh, uh, to remain at the tables with, with the Palestinians. And there's a couple of things about this, and one of the things was in the news this morning in Israel. It's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the things you realize is that to get, it, to get the Palestinians to come uh, to the peace conference, to even talk about peace, Israel had to uh, release 104 terrorists, many of whom convicted murders. And uh, that's what Israel had to do to get the Palestinians uh, to come to the uh, the peace talks, what did the Palestinians have to do? Nothing. <laughs> they just they only demand. They they uh, uh, they they do not give. Uh, and uh, and so Israel has done that in segments, releasing you know 23, 25 people at a time in segments to keep this thing moving forward because they want peace. They want side by side uh, two states uh, uh, living peacefully together, but be able to be secure uh, in whatever framework has now been uh, established by, uh, by Kerry, uh, trying to move forward. That's all coming uh, to an end. Uh, the last prisoner release is going to happen soon. Uh, and so now uh, the push is for to keep uh, Israel at the table, agree to this framework. They've uh, floated the idea via the uh, Israeli press this morning, uh, the release uh, of Jonathan Pollard. Now, Jonathan Pollard, if you don't know who that is, uh, 30 years ago, he worked for the government uh, and our government, uh, and he gave away secrets to a friendly nation, Israel. The typical sentence for some, that crime is about five years. He received life imprisonment, uh, and he's been in prison now for 30 years. Much older man uh, and very poor health. Uh, every time there's an election in Israel uh, and there's a new prime minister that comes uh, uh, into, uh, into the office, one of the first things they do is they request the release of Jonathan Pollard. Uh, and, of course, they haven't gotten anywhere yet, uh, but he's older, he's dying. So now the U.S. is uh, kind of floating the trial balloon uh, via the press in Israel uh, that uh, if they agreed to release Pollard, uh, would Netanyahu stay uh, at the tables? Of course, he's going to have to release more terrorists out of their jails in order to keep the Palestinians there. So, uh, you know, it's... Uh, you know, and it's, it's not going to happen because uh, 
uh, Palestinian Authority will not recognize uh, Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, uh, there's some other uh, roadblocks. Israel has uh, uh, agreed to give them land, to give them swap for land, to uh, uh, you know bend over backwards, but uh, those peace talks aren't going anywhere. But it's still very uh, interesting to watch the extremes uh, that uh, uh, current administration will go to to try to keep those peace talks alive. So uh, interesting to, uh, to watch those things. Uh, Israel... Unless you're sitting in an evangelical church in the United States, uh, you're, you're not hearing what, I, what I'm telling you uh, today in terms of what they have to do in order to survive and keep, uh, keep moving forward because they are, betrayed, are portrayed always as the occupier. Uh, and that's the word that's used throughout our, our universities uh, in this country, uh, sometimes through the media, uh, certainly the left-leaning media, uh, and uh, all through uh, Western Europe today. We call that the new anti-Semitism uh, they won't come right out and be an anti-Semitic to a Jewish person, but they will to the nation of Jewish persons, uh, uh, the nation of, of Israel. And one of the things to keep in mind with that term uh, that I found interesting reading uh, uh, one of uh, uh, Netanyahu's uh, uh, books about the history of uh, Israel recently uh, is this idea of occupier and where it comes from. Uh, we sometimes talk about the Jews have been out of Israel for 2,000 years, and it's a miracle that they're, they're back in the land once again in our generation and our day. Uh, actually, that's not quite true. They've been out of the country for 1,000 years. Uh, they, they, they lived in their country. Jewish people have always lived in Israel for thousands of years until the rise of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, uh, I don't know if you even, uh, a number of years ago, I was in Pakistan uh, visiting some of our, our folks there. And they took me to an ancient palace fortress uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And it was impressive. And I'm like, who are these guys? I was just, you know, it wasn't the best student, you know, when I was in school. But it's like, man, who, who are these guys? You know, I learned a lot, you know, on that trip. And I came back and, uh, and read a little bit more. But, man, they controlled everything. as Muslims. They controlled everything from northern India all the way into Spain and, and half of France uh, before the... First Crusade began to try to drive them out of Europe and re regain. That meant that the, the Spanish were driven out of their home country uh, for about, uh, I'm just off the top of my head, six or seven hundred years. Uh, then they were able to go back into that country once again. Nobody refers to the Spanish today as occupiers. They're just Spanish in their country. Israel was driven by the same Ottoman Empire out of, out of the country. The Jews living in Israel were driven out of their homeland uh, by the Ottoman Empire. Eventually, they were able to get back in again. They were out for about 1,000 years. They were out maybe 300, 400 years longer than the Spanish were, but somehow they are referred to as occupiers. Uh, you see, it, it doesn't make sense. Nobody calls the Spanish occupiers, but... You hear that word all the time. If you hear it, you can refute it with that argument of the Spanish. It's their land. It's their homeland. They've lived there for thousands of years. They were driven out by Muslims, and as soon as they could get back in, uh, they got back in, but it took them a 1,000 years to do that. Uh, and they're asked to basically give the heart of Israel uh, over to the uh, Palestinian authorities and what we refer to as the West Bank. So uh, interesting times that uh, we're living in. And uh, it's been very interesting, again, to, uh, to watch uh, uh, senators and congressmen do uh, interviews on the news. And I think they must have read Joel Rosenberg's book. Because now <laughs> I think they, they get it. They're almost quoting Epicenter when, uh, when they talk about Putin, who he is, and so forth. But uh, he's a guy to keep uh, our eye on. And maybe we'll see that, or maybe we won't, because the rapture of the church will occur at any time. There's nothing that says we'll see the Magog invasion, or maybe we'll be here and we'll see it. But boy, if we see it, then uh, uh, just, I don't know, start witnessing to your neighbors as you fast as you can. I, I don't think we'll be around a whole lot longer uh, after a dramatic display of God's power like that. But uh, maybe we'll see it and, uh, and see it very soon. All right, we'll turn to Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at the uh, beginning of the Apostle Paul as he moves from the transition of Saul of Tarsus to becoming uh, the apostle that certainly we, we know and love. 
And we're going to look first uh, in verses 19 to 25 at Paul's pattern of growth. It's not one that we're unfamiliar with. It's some pretty basic things like spending time with the Lord and fellowship and so forth. Uh, and the, the concern of teaching the familiar uh, uh, reminded uh, uh, me of a story that I read this week uh, because it caught my attention because one of the guys in the story was a, a pastor preacher type and he was with a doctor and a lawyer and they were deer hunting uh, and uh, they'd been in a in their blind all morning and finally a beautiful buck came uh, over uh, over the ridge and they all uh, locked on at the same time and all fired at the same time and of course as they walked to the deer all arguing whose shot actually took uh, their deer down as they finally uh, come upon the deer just in time uh, fortunately uh, a game warden happened to pull up and uh, uh, and they said to him well uh, maybe you can settle this argument because uh, you know, we all shot at the same time. And he says, well, let me take a look at the deer. And he, he bent down, and he looked at, uh, at the wound, and he stood up, and he said, the, the preacher got him. And they said, well, I, I, can you tell that so fast? He says, it went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> and uh, that sometimes is the concern when we teach basic things like this. And um, I, I know it doesn't tie real directly in, but uh, I just thought he'd get a story in there. Verse 19, so when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in synagogues uh, that he is the Son of God. And and let me just say that that is the normal theology, uh, first century uh, Judaism, that the Messiah is the Son of God. They don't teach that anymore, uh, but they taught it in the first century. Their issue was, was Jesus the Christ or the Messiah? That that was the issue, and you're going to see that. Paul's going to uh, prove that uh, uh, to them through the scriptures. But in the first century, they believed that when the Messiah came, he would be the Son of God. Uh, Verse 21, Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Messiah or is the Christ. Now, for many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Uh, so the first pattern we notice certainly is fellowship, very straightforward in verse 19. Saul spent some days with the disciples at uh, Damascus, uh, and that's, uh, that's the obvious that we hope don't, doesn't go uh, in one ear and out the other, is that you really cannot grow in Christ. You can't mature in Christ apart from fellowship. It just can't be done. Uh, there's uh, a few folks... Uh, uh, in their homes and places, uh, you know, watching the, on the internet right now, and, and God bless them, and uh, they're going to get the information from uh, the sermon and keep up with the study, and that's great, but uh, uh, people that do that and only do that will never mature in Christ. They'll just remain uh, babies in Christ that are uh, have a lot of knowledge, but uh, uh, it's impossible to grow uh, in Jesus Christ because you're not around other believers that can uh, provide encouragement to you, that can provide godly examples for you. Uh, that can help you and strengthen you as you go through difficult times. You're not around other believers that can bug you. <laughs> and that's important because uh, that's part of growing, learning to, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be gracious, kind of like the uh, Rap Replinger character, the guy that uh, would sell the used cars, Marty Murdoch, the used car salesman. I'm dating some of you, and, uh, but uh, he has one line in, and there, when he's finally talking about how great the cars are and they're falling apart, uh, and then in the middle of and how great the cars are, and come down and see me, uh, you know, check out a car, perhaps an automobile. You know, he's got a couple of lines in there. And then he stops in the middle and he says, but you know what really bugs me? I got to be nice to you, but you know got to be nice to me. You know, it's a, that's the Christian life right there. Marty Murdoch, I got to be nice to you, but you know got to be nice to me. And if you don't learn to do that, you'll never mature in Christ. Isn't that, a, isn't that kind of a, a, a depressing thought? You mean, I need to go to church so people can kind of tick me off so I can learn how to be gracious? Kind of, kind of. I'm just saying it happens. I'm just saying it's going to happen, you know, because uh, the, the thing about the church is it's full of sinners. And uh, uh, if you're not sure about that, just check with your wife. She'll uh, inform you later. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, we, we need each other for a lot of purposes Uh, And one of them is that we'd learn to be more gracious. uh, Apart from fellowship, we'd never have an opportunity to exercise spiritual gifts. 
uh, we'd never have a, a, a many opportunities. There's opportunities to serve the Lord outside the church, certainly, but uh, a lot of them and a lot of people begin by serving in the church in a, in a friendly uh, uh, you know, environment before they step out to do uh, something more than that. Uh, uh, the, the, the new Christian needs to be nurtured in their faith. The mature Christian needs to be involved in that process. Sometimes when I'm, uh, I'm praying for, uh, for people, whether it's one of our missionaries or different people in the church, sometimes if I don't know exactly what's uh, uh, going on in their lives, I can always pray that God would bring them, in a sense, three people into their lives uh, to help them grow. And one would be, I pray that God would bring them an Apostle Paul, somebody that will mentor and disciple them and encourage them and exhort them and so forth, because we all, we all need uh, that kind of person in our lives. I also pray that God would bring them a Timothy, because it's important that there is someone in our life that we're ministering to and we're pouring in and uh, to whatever degree we're, uh, we're at. And that, that Timothy might only be six years old, uh, one of those kids in Sunday school, or might be uh, somebody at work, but somebody that, that we can uh, invest in. And then we certainly need a Barnabas. He's the third person. So somebody that just comes along and, and, uh, and uh, it keeps us encouraged uh, and, uh, and going because we all need that. And we're going to talk more about him in a moment. But uh, fellowship is so important. The pattern involved obedience, and we see that in verse 20 where it says, immediately he preached uh, the Christ or the Messiah. Immediately, some translations say at once. Uh, and it's an interesting phrase. It has to do with serving and a servant uh, in particular. In Mark's gospel, we find it used of Jesus repeatedly because Mark frames his gospel around the big theme uh, that Jesus uh, came as the servant. Uh, and therefore, he uses that phrase over and over again. In the ancient world, the idea of a servant was the only way he could serve uh, adequately and appropriately is if he kept his eyes on the master all the time. Uh, because the master didn't say to the servant, hey, you! No, he just, all he did was he just gave him a look. He nodded his head and maybe moved his hand. Everything was quiet. Everything was subtle. There's a, a bank going on. The servant is watching him as he's, he's taking care of other people because he's looking for that, that next command. It's not going to be verbal. He's got to have his eyes on him so he can immediately respond. That's our word. That's the idea. Uh, Paul is a, a brand new believer at this point. He's in fellowship with other believers, uh, and uh, he is immediately uh, finds himself serving. In this case, uh, he's out witnessing, which uh, uh, certainly leads to our next characteristic or growth point that we need. Uh, but Jesus says this in John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That's the idea of obedience. But notice the, the promise here. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's a tremendous benefit to being obedient, to keeping your eyes on the master. To be able to know when he signals, when he says go, when he says stay, and uh, whatever's going on. Uh, to be able to hear from the Lord. He'll come and make his abode, his home uh, with him. Uh, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, uh, you'll bear much fruit. Uh, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. And, uh, and sometimes we miss that point and we fail uh, in growing in our faith in Jesus Christ. The third pattern involved uh, being a, not just a witness, but I'm seeing a credible witness, uh, and that's something we all need to work on. Verse 21, Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name of Jerusalem? Uh, the word amazed is ecstatic. Uh, it would be a literal translation, astonished. Uh, amazed. Here Saul of Tarsus has come. Uh, he's the murderer of Christians, and now he's proclaiming that Jesus uh, is uh, the Messiah. Uh, the papers the next day read, uh, Come here, Dr. Saul of Tarsus, the great Gamaliel's protege, converted Pharisee, tells all. I think they might have made a reality show about him. But uh, uh, people are shocked at, uh, at what uh, is going, uh, going on. Uh, but notice what Paul is, uh, is able to do. Uh, at verse 22, he increases all the more in strength, confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus. Key word, proving, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. The word proving means to join together. And what Paul was able to do is join together the scriptures of the Old Testament uh, that talked about the Messiah. I'm sure he took him to Psalm 22. He took him to Isaiah 53. He took passages that dealt with, uh, with the Messiah. So he could prove to them, give them a reason why they might place their faith in Jesus. 
establish credibility uh, in terms of uh, who Jesus is and why they should accept him as, as the Messiah. One of our guys that we've got uh, a picture on the back wall there uh, who is on Israel today. I got a, uh, we got one of the, his newsletters, uh, uh, and he mentioned the fact that uh, they go to Tel Aviv, and then Tel, Tel Aviv is kind of the, uh, the Waikiki of, uh, of Israel. It's right there on the Mediterranean uh, and everything, and there's uh, uh, like you would go to uh, you know, Kalaka Avenue. There's, uh, there, there's an area, you know, walkways along the and all the shops and so forth, and they go down. It's a great place to do uh, witnessing and handing out tracts. There are a couple of days a, a week. You have people visiting, of course, from around the world. You have a lot of, a lot of Israelis, a lot of Jews that were there. Uh, and the last time we were there, they were using a, a survey that uh, one of the other uh, guys had developed, and, uh, and it was just to say, hey, could, would you take a minute and take a survey, uh, uh, and uh, we want to ask you a few questions about about the Messiah. Now, they don't say Jesus uh, or anything. They just know there's a Messiah. Uh, he's coming and so forth about the Messiah uh, and who his identity might be. Uh, and so they, uh, on that afternoon, between their teams, they covered about uh, 60 people. Uh, and one of the first questions is, can you name me uh, a scripture in the Tanakh, the, the uh, Jewish Bible, the Old Testament scriptures? To, can you name me one scripture that talks about the Messiah? <laughs> one guy. One out of 60. Of course, if we went to Waikiki, we probably wouldn't even get one guy. <laughs> you know, but uh, it's kind of surprising. You know, there's a, a, certainly a, a biblical illiteracy uh, in, uh, in Israel in general, uh, even the way that we have uh, in this country. But Paul knew that these guys knew the scriptures, and he could use that to reason, to prove, to develop a credible witness. In a sense, he was trying to earn the right, got to break the news to them, that Jesus is the Messiah. And in fact, he died on a Roman cross for their sins. But he kind of had to work up to that. I think we're in that same position today. Uh, a lot of people, uh, we have to and establish some credibility so that we can share uh, the gospel with them. And that in our application, it can be kind of illustrated this way. I read a story uh, about Jerry Falwell. His son is writing it. Jerry Falwell was the uh, founder of... Uh, uh, Liberty uh, Baptist uh, uh, Church there in Virginia. Uh, he is, uh, Liberty University is, uh, he founded, is now the largest uh, Christian university in, in, the, uh, in the world uh, and uh, doing quite well. And uh, Jerry Fall was, was um, a guy that in his day uh, called Christians back into the political process. Of course, we're, uh, we're saying that all the time and we're kind of reaping the consequences of, uh, of a generation of Christians that were not involved uh, but uh, he formed what was called the moral majority. Uh, in the day. Of course, criticized on, on both sides uh, for his involvement in speaking out on uh, uh, social issues uh, uh, and political stances and so forth. Anyway, he's, uh, his son is saying, he, his son's a kid, he's flying with his dad down to Florida, where his dad's going to debate uh, Larry Flint, the uh, owner and publisher of uh, uh, Penthouse uh, Magazine. And uh, which uh, none of you ever heard of, don't know anything about, but it's uh, filled with pornography. I'm just telling you. But uh, anyway, he's kind of uh, one of the major players in the uh, pornography industry. So he was going down to debate him, uh, which he did. Uh, and then on the way home, uh, they were on the same plane, seated right next to each other. And, uh, you know, Falwell's <laughs> son, he's a grown man now, he's thinking, well, this ought to be good. You know, he's waiting for the whole debate just to go right. You know, on the plane, hope they don't get thrown off, you know. And, uh, but that's, that's not what happened. He was amazed. His dad sat there, and he shot the breeze with this guy like he was an old friend. They talked about sports. They talked about politics. They talked about fishing. They talked about all kinds of stuff for like three hours. And, and then he, they got off the plane, and he said to his dad, what, what, what are you doing? I mean, that guy is against everything we're for, and we're for everything he's against, and how could you treat him that way? And uh, you, you treated him like he was like a church member or uh, even a, a part of the family. I don't understand. And Jerry Falwell said, one day that man will be in trouble, and one day he'll make a phone call, and I'm trying to earn the right that maybe he would call me. That's what I'm trying to do. Because we have the solution. We have the answers to his life and everybody's life in terms of relationship with Christ. Trying to earn the right that he might call us. Uh, and I think that's a way that uh, we can prove the scriptures, join things together, uh, even Paul did. 
because a lot of people we're, we're talking to and sharing with, they don't have a Bible background. Uh, we can explain Psalm 22 to them, and I, I don't think they're impressed. I mean, they might be, uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to do something to gain credibility so we, can, so we can get to Psalm 22, so we can get to Isaiah 53, so we can get to, uh, to John 3.16. Uh, but Paul is doing that. I think that's a, a, an important pattern for us as well. Fourth, the pattern involved personal time with the Lord. Verse 23 says, now after many days, we're I'll read you a passage in Galatians uh, in a moment where he writes letter later so that we know that, that uh, the many days were actually three years. Uh, from the time of his conversion, he goes into the desert of Arabia. From the time he gets back uh, and then leaves for Jerusalem, that's a three-year period. Was he in the desert a year, two years, two and a half years? We don't know, but it was certainly an extended uh, period of time. Saul was an impressive guy with a tremendous uh, education. Uh, we could probably say that uh, Moses in the Old Testament, uh, Saul of Tarsus in the New Testament, both were probably the, uh, the most educated and highly intellectual men of their day uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the scriptures. Uh, Moses needed to go on the, uh, on the backside of a desert for 40 years to kind of get over himself. Uh, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, uh, well, it took a couple years uh, anyway. That's the whole point. You know, there's a lot of times when uh, people of status, whether it's a Hollywood type, a sports figure, uh, come to faith in Christ, and, uh, and uh, you know, within the, the church, we'd say, well, oh, man, get that guy right out front and sharing his testimony and so forth, but, you know, God's economy doesn't really work that way. Uh, he was in no hurry to do that with the Apostle Paul, and Paul says nobody should be either. Uh, writing a letter uh, later to uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, 6, he says, of, of those in leadership out there uh, front line serving the ministry, he says, should not be a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation of the devil. Uh, Paul was able to say that because he didn't do it. He just didn't just jump right out and uh, uh, begin his missionary journeys and so forth. Uh, in fact, from the time Paul is saved to his first missionary journey is a 10-year period. Again, we, we keep getting condensed here uh, in the book of Acts, but it's, uh, uh, it's taken years for some of these things to actually uh, play out. Paul didn't, uh, was, didn't say, hey, I went right into the ministry, but I'm the exception. Other people, that's not such a good idea. No, he says, I, I did it this way, and there's a lot of wisdom in it. You might fall into pride. Uh, time alone with the Lord. Uh, now, what, what took place with that time in the Lord? Obviously, we don't know. But what we do know is Paul asked two very distinct questions uh, to Jesus when he revealed himself on the Damascus Road. Who are you, Lord? And uh, and what shall I do? Of course, we just sang yeah, uh, that expression, what shall I do? So uh, that, that's a great question for all of us uh, to be asking, as Mark said, on a very regular basis. The first thing that Paul would have learned is who Jesus was. Already convinced, uh, but certainly uh, he needed to, uh, in a sense, uh, recalculate uh, in his own mind who Jesus really was through all of those scriptures that Paul would have memorized as a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, the grandson of a Pharisee, he probably would have had most of the, uh, the Jewish Bible memorized. Uh, yes, they, they did it back, uh, back then. Uh, he would have had most of it memorized. But now to go through those scriptures and think through the fact of who Jesus was and the Messiah, and then he had to die for our sins and, and rethink through all of what we might call types and shadows of the Old Testament. Uh, and certainly they're there, according to Jesus. In Luke 24, 27, Jesus is post-resurrection, walking on the, uh, the road to uh, the town among two of, uh, of the disciples who were very downcast because they've uh, heard of the death of Jesus. His resurrection, you remember, he comes along and begins to have a conversation with them and says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, this is he, Jesus, expounded to them uh, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Uh, but it's not on MP3. Uh, it, <laughs> wow, that would be an awesome Bible study. Jesus going through and explain uh, every page of Scripture or where he can uh, where he can be found. J. Vernon McGee used, used to say that. I'm convinced that uh, on every page in the Old Testament you can find Jesus. He goes, I I may not personally be able to find him, but I think uh, if you studied hard enough you'd be able to find him. And certainly, that's what Paul's doing. He has to kind of rethink through his entire biblical education in the light of Secondly, he had to fully understand uh, Christ's explicit declaration that I am Jesus. 
Paul couldn't really relate to this idea of a, a vulnerable God, that God would leave heaven and die on a cross and make himself vulnerable. Uh, he didn't see the Messiah coming in that way. He, like others, were looking for the conquering king. He wasn't looking for a vulnerable servant. Uh, the idea that when, when believers on this earth are persecuted, uh, Jesus says, I'm going through it with him. Uh, the idea of the cross, I think, I had to take on a, a whole different meeting for Paul as he understood that, uh, that God made himself vulnerable. How vulnerable uh, that he would die on a Roman cross for our sins. And then Paul had to learn who he was. In uh, he had to uh, understand the words of Isaiah 6 where the, the prophet brought up to heaven uh, as a good friend, the, the king, and in a sense of mourning, he has this vision of God and the throne of God. And, uh, and uh, as he uh, is revealed to him, he says, woe is me, I'm a man undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. That word undone means disintegrating. He goes, uh, in light of God's holiness and those angels proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The prophet Isaiah, uh, who was no wimp when it comes to his spiritual life, says, man, I am disintegrating. The apostle Paul, like us, needs to understand who we are in the light of God's holiness and his righteousness and what it is, he really has done for us in terms of uh, that vulnerability and dying on the cross. Paul would say, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, and so forth. Uh, he's uh, outdistanced his contemporaries. Uh, but he needed to come to the place where uh, he could be renamed Paul, which, by the way, means small. No longer the great Saul of Tarsus. I'm nothing, I can do nothing apart from Jesus Christ, as we might paraphrase one of his lines. Alan Redpath, one of my favorite writers, says, When God wants to use us to do an impossible, impossible task, he takes an impossible man and he crushes him. And uh, sometimes we're, it takes us a while maybe a couple years in the desert before we realize that we're okay with that because we know that God is going to remake us. These are all things that Paul was probably going through, and then he had to learn, of course, what God wanted him to do, to be a missionary, the great apologist, uh, to take the gospel uh, to the world, and that it would involve some pain. And, of course, being prepared uh, for service, again, as I mentioned, speaks of that God takes his time. Jesus spent 17, 18 years, depending on how he related, uh, for three years of ministry. This is Jesus, 17 years of preparation for three years of ministry. Forty days uh, alone, of fasting and praying, before he would even be, uh, begin uh, his, uh, his ministry. The Lord's not in a hurry <laughs> about things, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, certainly we are. Paul had probably several degrees at that point, but he received a new one, a DD, a Doctorate of the Desert. And, uh, uh, and he needed it. He needed it. Uh, as we mentioned before, he went into Damascus on a very tall horse. <laughs> and he needed to be uh, knocked to his knees. Now here's a line that, uh, in, uh, in Galatians, in Galatians 1.15, that mentions the, uh, the time frame and how long. They are re re uh, writing about this incident, he says. But when, when it pleased God To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, uh, the Lord's brother. So the natural plan for Saul would be promotion. God's plan was seclusion. Uh, the many days, uh, again, is just a figure of speech. doesn't translate well over into English. Many days seems like a couple of weeks. Going on vacation? Many days. No, we're, nobody's thinking three years. But uh, it is used in other places in Scripture. For example, in 1 Kings 2, 38, uh, a couple of words. This is Shammai, who, who uh, was uh, kind of survives the... Uh, uh, Absalom rebellion is still in, uh, in Jerusalem, and it says about him, as Shammai said to the king, uh, the saying is good, uh, as my lord the king has said, so will your servant do. So Shammai dwelt in Jerusalem many days. Verse 39, uh, now it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shammai ran away to Achish, the son of Maacah, king of Gath, uh, and they told Shammai, saying, look, your slaves are in Gath. 
He leaves Jerusalem. He wasn't supposed to do that. He gets uh, executed. That's a whole other story. Our point is many days, three years. Uh, so uh, we have the same thing here. Uh, there's no contradiction. Paul says, I was many days. Uh, it was actually a three, uh, a three period. The setting of his seclusion is kind of interesting. He goes to the very place where Moses went. He goes to the very place where Elijah begins uh, uh, his ministry. He stands in the shadow of Mount Sinai where Moses received the law, the law that he defended and knew so well as a Pharisee. But now he had to come to understand it in a whole different light. Pattern for growth, fellowship, obedience, like a servant. Our witness, and, uh, and a lot of times our witness is, uh, uh, is uh, there's a precursor needed, and that is to gain credibility. Of course, uh, that's uh, uh, not just in our knowledge of scriptures and be able to keep up with current events to relate with those around us, uh, but it's how we live our lives so that people would want to uh, understand and hear the reasons for the hope that lies within. And then uh, you can't do that without personal quiet time with the Lord. You know, time uh, daily and some time, you know, some extended time periodically uh, so that we can spend time uh, alone with the Lord. We see Jesus did it very often, getting up in the morning, getting alone with the Lord, taking his guys away for extended period of times. Uh, it's what we need uh, if we're going to be able to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ and mature. Now the persecution. You say, I, I don't know that if I, I like that, uh, the way this is organized here. You're telling me that if I do these things and I grow in my faith in Jesus Christ, then comes the persecution? Yeah, probably. That's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, it may not be what two-thirds of the Christians around the world are facing today, uh, but I, when you begin to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ, there's some pushback. Uh, there's an enemy that Like, he doesn't, he doesn't really care what you're doing with your Christianity if you don't either. Uh, but if you begin to kind of move out and move forward to do something for the kingdom of God, share your faith with other people, some find some place of service where you can uh, do something to, to further the kingdom of God in somebody's life and so forth, there's going to be some pushback. We're not supposed to be discouraged by that. We're supposed to realize that, uh, hey, I must be uh, doing something right. Uh, a number of years ago, I remember... Uh, uh, when C. Everett Koop was the uh, point of the uh, uh, Surgeon General, I think under uh, President Bush one, uh, that uh, and he was a, a wonderful uh, evangelical Christian guy, uh, brilliant guy, and uh, uh, and he was expecting to, uh, a lot of heat in that position, and uh, he was uh, you know going along uh, a year or so to office, and uh, he said in a interview, and I'm not being criticized by the right. I think it's time to re-examine my position. Because <laughs> he figured if he's doing some good, uh, there's going to be some criticism along the way. Uh, and certainly we see that with the Apostle Paul. Verse 23, now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates, uh, the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. So his... Uh, uh, ministry begins with resistance as he, uh, you think the Apostle Paul was just like pretty, pretty good at uh, sharing his faith and expounding from, uh, from, uh, from the scriptures uh, and so forth. I took my apologetics from uh, J.B., J.P., uh, J.D. Moore, uh, Moore, Moreland, wonderful uh, apologist, uh, teaches at uh, Biola uh, now and he was just telling stories about a, a friend. A friend is trying to witness to his, uh, to his friend and share with him. So he invites J.P. Moreland over. It's like, how many of us can do that? You know, get one of the smartest guys on the planet to uh, come share with your friend or whatever. But uh, uh, why can't we do that? But uh, uh, Paul was that kind of, kind of guy. Uh, you can see why he would upset a few people along the way uh, to the point that they're re ready to kill him. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32, uh, he's making reference to this event and gives us a couple more details. It's kind of interesting. He says, in Damascus, the governor under uh, Aratus, the king, was guarding the, the city of, uh, the, of Damascus with a garrison desiring to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hand. So it's not just the Jews that are in, uh, uh, in the... Uh, we'll get him. So he's uh, able to be uh, let down uh, through a, a, a wall in the city. 
Uh, and a couple of things are interesting about this. Uh, archaeologically, we know that these kind of apartments uh, were built uh, in the city walls, and that ancient wall still exists in Damascus today. It doesn't go as high as it would have in Paul's day, uh, but it, uh, it is still there. Uh, and you can see the, the remains of that. Uh, but tremendous opposition against the Apostle Paul. Uh, again, it had to be uh, somewhat uh, exhilarating to know he must be on, uh, on the right track. Winston Churchill once said, nothing is so exhilarating as to be shot at without results. <laughs> kind of think about it. The boys experienced that doing paintball yesterday. Kind of exhilarating to be shot at without results. Nobody hits you. But exhilarating time for Paul. Uh, he's got this many uh, enemies. He must be doing something right for, uh, for the kingdom of God. Uh, but, of course, the persecution would grow worse. I want to read this now, and I'll allude to it later, because we have this gap in time, because Paul is going to uh, kind of fade to black in terms of the scriptures right here, and then he's going to uh, arrive on the scene later in chapter 11, uh, and it's seven years later. What happens to Paul in that seven-year period? Part of it is found in this passage in 2 Corinthians. My point in reading it now is in regards to his... Um, persecution. He says, uh, are, they, uh, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, speaking of the, uh, the false apostles. Uh, I am more, and labor is in abundant, and stripe is in prison more frequently, and deaths often. Uh, from the Jews, uh, times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned in uh, journeys often in perils and waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toll, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. It wasn't an easy life for the Apostle Paul. Uh, yeah, he has a pattern that he's followed. There is persecution, uh, but he's not going to let that uh, deter him from the calling of God uh, on his life and doing something for the kingdom of God. Now, there's a, a cool little thing that we kind of miss in verse pointed out to you. There it says, then the disciples took, uh, uh, took him by night. disciples, then his disciples. Uh, it was his guys, the guys he had been discipling. Uh, you know, sometimes when uh, uh, you need to get uh, let down by ropes uh, off of a, a 30 or 40 foot wall, you kind of want to be able to trust the guys holding the ropes. <laughs> Hope they like me. <laughs> uh, but he knew them. Uh, again, this goes back to the fellowship and the discipling. Uh, and, uh, and often when we're uh, when we're willing to uh, be known and know others, uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. When we're going through a trial, uh, things are threatening to us to know that there are people that we can trust, that will hold the ropes uh, for us as we uh, uh, move on to where we're going. Whatever the next thing is, but uh, 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 Paul's pattern was... Uh, of growth is one that we can follow. The persecution began. He's ready now to proceed to Jerusalem. That's in verse 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Wouldn't you love that? I've become a Christian now. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I don't believe that. But uh, uh, that would be a little difficult. could be discouraging. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them, how he had seen the Lord on the road, and how that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. Uh, but they uh, attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him uh, down. Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, uh, they were multiplied. So Paul is, uh, again, not initially accepted there in Jerusalem. And uh, again, he was just uh, notorious for uh, killing Christians and torturing them and so forth. And uh, uh, people don't forget that easy. It's three years later, but uh, they are, they're still afraid. They're, they're afraid of the Apostle Paul. Uh, but what happens here is uh, 
uh, is really amazing. Then we'd say, secondly, he's assisted by Barnabas. Now, we've been introduced to uh, Barnabas earlier. Uh, the apostles have actually given him the name Barnabas, which means some of encouragement. His real name is Joseph. Uh, man, when you get, when you get re- renamed, <laughs> son of encouragement. Uh, You, you must be over the top. Uh, pretty much grabbed him uh, and, and took him right, at, right into the uh, uh, apostles' uh, uh, presence. And, of course, they become lifelong uh, friends at this point. Uh, and uh, Barnes becomes the bridge uh, to Paul and the, uh, the other apostles. Uh, notice uh, uh, his background. He was a Levite. Uh, so he would be, he's from a priestly family. He'd be, Paul would have, Saul of Tarsus would have known who, uh, who Barnabas was already. Uh, he's also from, uh, uh, you know, kind of the Greek upbringing. Uh, one's from Cy- Cyprus, the other one's from Cilicia. It's not, it's not that far away. You know, sim- similar uh, backgrounds for both of these guys. Um, it's in uh, ch- uh, chapter 4, verse 36, that we meet uh, Barnabas. It says, and then Joseph, or uh, Joseph, or Joseph, some translations, uh, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. meet him, but now he plays a, uh, a, a very important role in the Apostle Paul's life and, of course, then to the furthering of the kingdom uh, of God. Uh, in terms of why he did this, I think it was just his nature, obviously. Could have been his, uh, his gifting in terms of, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we all can be used by God to encourage one another. There are some people that are just over the top. This is their gifting, and uh, uh, they're just uh, nice people to be around because they're Wow, they're just so, so encouraging and stuff, and it's such a blessing to be around them. And I, I'm sure that Barnabas was, uh, was one of those guys. Uh, Paul then next does what he can to advance the gospel. We see that in verse uh, disputing with the Hellenists. Keep in mind who they are. Uh, you know, again, the Greek-speaking Jews of Jerusalem have huge synagogue uh, was literally in when he heard Stephen uh, very adequately uh, defending the faith, we might say, and proving that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul is there as Saul of Tarsus, uh, overseeing the execution of Stephen uh, by these men from this setting. He's back in Jerusalem. He's accepted by uh, the apostles. What's the first thing he does? <laughs> right into the dragon's throat. He's just going right back in there. What happened to the last guy that went in there and defended Jesus as Messiah? Oh, that's right. They took him out and killed him. Hey, I think I'll give that a shot. That was the Apostle Paul. Uh, he's not alone in that. You can read about other great leaders. I read a couple of books about uh, Hudson Taylor as a young guy when he first gets to China. And they're trying to brief him, the missionaries that are already uh, there in coastal areas. But, of course, he establishes the China Inland Mission. He was willing to had not gone before. And some of these places, they would say, uh, now, uh, Mr. Taylor, whatever you do, don't go here. This is a terrible place to go in. Uh, and uh, it's full of gambling and prostitution and blood. So whatever you do, so he goes there. I mean, you, you just tell the guy, don't go there. I'm going there. You know, that, those people need Jesus Christ, maybe more than anybody else. Uh, that, that's the Apostle Paul kind of, kind of attitude here. Killed the last guy? Well, let's, let's just give this a shot here and see, see, see what happens. Uh, speaking boldly uh, in the name of the Lord. Uh, and then from that, those guys are trying to kill him now. He's fled two cities. Paul receives advice to leave uh, Jerusalem, to head back home. Uh, it sounds like uh, the uh, apostles kind of hear what happened in the synagogue, uh, and therefore they are plot when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance uh, and saw uh, him Jesus saying to me make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me so I said Lord uh, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you and when your the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him Uh, then he said to me depart for I will send you far from here to Jerusalem. Paul's in the temple. He's praying. God uh, speaks to him like a vision and says, man, you better get out of Dodge. And I mean right now. And you're not going to do any good here. uh, And I do have a commission for you. I'm warning you, but I'm also reminding you 
commission to take the gospel to to the Gentiles. Now once uh, goes home then to uh, this area of Cilicia uh, uh, or Tars- Tarsus. From scripture, most of the time he spent just watching television. Not, not actually. Yeah, what we find from scripture is that he's he's pretty active guy. Uh, we have every reason to believe that basically he takes that as his headquarters and begins to spread the gospel uh, where he can in the uh, the Roman in- Empire. Uh, notice uh, he. Uh, in Galatians, he talks about ministering in the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And again, Tarsus is the city. Cilicia is the, uh, is the province. So it's in the area where he was uh, brought up. Uh, in Acts 15, there, there are churches, when they talk about churches having been established already uh, in Cilicia. In Corinthians, uh, he's kind of def- the church founded and probably by the Apostle Paul. So he's not at home watching TV. Uh, he's out. Uh, uh, preaching the gospel and establishing his apostleship. He talks about how many times he got beat up and the shipwrecks. And all. There's, there's no accounting for a lot of that stuff in the book of Acts. It doesn't happen after that time. It happened before that time. It had to have happened during this uh, seven or eight year period. Uh, and, uh, uh, in Acts, we have uh, uh, one Roman beating, two are not accounted for. Uh, we have no accounting for the five Jewish beatings uh, in the book of Acts or the epistles either. We've got one shipwreck in Acts 27. Uh, we don't have a record of two other shipwrecks. Uh, it doesn't sound like Paul had much of a vacation. Uh, he was out there uh, preaching the gospel, uh, being persecuted for it, going through some very difficult uh, times in his life. Uh, and then he reemerges on the pages of Scripture as we get Barnabas now, the son of encouragement, the guy that uh, reached out the right hand of fellowship and to the uh, uh, apostles so that they would uh, accept him, uh, he goes and gets him. He goes and gets him for a good, very good reason. I think I've kind of had it in my mind that sometimes that, that uh, Barnabas is like, you know, Paul's down there just kind of not doing much, you know, down there in Tarsus. So, you know, I'll just kind of get him up here and kind of get him involved in ministry. I don't think that was it at all. I think he heard what Paul was doing, and he had his hands full. Uh, he's, in, he's in Antioch. Uh, it's a shipping port. It's a cosmopolitan uh, city. There are people there from all over uh, the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, there are people that are getting saved from lots of different cultures, and mostly Greek-speaking, some are Arabic-speaking. You have Jews that are there that are saved. They like him. Uh, who can church that's got this mixture of Jews and Gentiles in it, and even the Gentiles are many cultures. I was like, man, I'm going to go get the apostle, uh, quote the Greek poets and so forth and relate to uh, all of these Gentile converts. I need somebody with cross-cultural experience, and Paul's the man. I'm going to go get him and ask him if he'll come help me here. I, I think it was more like that than, than um, I'll help him out by getting him involved in ministry. I think Barnabas was like, man, I sure hope he comes back with me. Uh, and of course he does, and, uh, and uh, we'll launch on, on to that when we get there and uh, continue the exciting journeys of the Apostle uh, Paul when we arrive. But again, pattern of growth that we can follow, uh, so important, uh, these things uh, we can expect, well, some kind of persecution if we're doing the other things. We're doing something for the kingdom of God, but uh, uh, proceed on to Jerusalem. What's the Jerusalem? What's the the next step for us? What does God have for us? And we're, we're growing in, in the Lord. And it uh, sure is fun to do it together, isn't it? Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we just thank you for uh, your word and being able to uh, study your word together. What a great, great privilege just to get together and study the Bible, Lord, and uh, go through it. It's so, so exciting. It's, uh, uh, we don't have to make it uh, relevant. It just is. Uh, all we have to do is just read it with an open heart. Hope it doesn't go in one ear and out the other. Lord, that's, uh, some of it uh, is used to uh, encourage us and to draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray that we would be why we grow up in. Uh, face persecution, as some are uh, in this country. I would say many are. The 
some degree or another, and maybe, maybe a few folks here. Uh, it's just it's not the country we grew up in in terms of Christianity. Things are changing. The Lord, even a, a little light can really shine in a dark place. So I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, Lord, and we might truly be your witnesses empowered by you, Lord, to uh, further your kingdom. And uh, others would come to know your love and your grace, your mercy, even as we have. And Lord, it's to that end that we study, we want to grow, and pray you'd use us in Jesus' name. Amen.